to see everybody tonight. Um, I, um, my name is Johannes Gibsrud, and I'm really happy to have rejoined POG and um, to be working with this great group of people bringing these great group of poets um, together. And tonight we have a wonderful, wonderful night. I'm really happy to be here. I'm in a parking lot right now. Um, so I'll keep this, uh, I'll keep this brief um, and just want to shout out to everybody who has helped to make this possible. We wouldn't be here tonight without AZ Cares, uh, poets and writers, without, um, thanks to the UA Poetry Center, to Chax Press, to the UA English Department, to Arizona Quarterly. Um, also, um, thank you to all of uh, the individual supporters, Charles Alexander, Mary Ellen Bartholomew, Charles Bernstein, Cynthia Hogue, Jason Lacap Lagapa, Joan Larkin, Judith Lefebvre, Cameron Louie, Lisa Martin, Eric Matchett, John Lillo, Cynthia Miller, T Tenny Nathanson, Nancy Quigg, Stephen Romagnello, Stephen, Stephen Salmoni, Will Stanier, Richard Tavener, David Weiss, Karen Brennan, Cutthroat, A Journal of the Arts, Reed Dixon, Lynn Finger, Maggie Golston, Barbara Henning, Jean Hooving, Anna Lambert, Little Red Leaves, Heidi McDonald, Barbara Miller, Laura Mullen, Jameson Nunix, Oracle Retreat for Writers, Jenna Osman, Propolis Press, Anthony Sovak, Mariah Starr, Cole Swenson, Susan Thackeray, and Michelle Worthington. Um, so you are also um, um, more than welcome to join this uh, long and wonderful list of people um, by donating on the website, um, including the possibility of becoming a patron or a sponsor um, or pledging some other amount. So um, thank you to all of those who continue to support POG and all the wonderful um, work that POG does. Um, we are, uh, POG is a safe space, um, and um, we've got board members floating around here on the Zoom screen. Um, please just uh, um, message one of us um, in a chat uh, or find some other way of communicating if you feel unsafe in any way, and we hope everybody has a, a lovely um, time tonight. And before we begin, I'd, also, I'd like to acknowledge that the Indigenous peoples of, the, of all the lands that we call home, Tucson, where POG is based, is located on the ancestral territories of the Tohono O'odham and Pasquayaki nations. So let's please take this moment to reflect now on how in the wake of a history of violence and dispossession, we can move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And um, with, without further ado, I'd like to um, pass this over to um, our first introducer, who is Brandon Shimoda, who will be introducing John Malillo. And after that, um, Charles Alexander will be introducing Ann Waldman and the night will proceed like that. Um, so thank you all and, uh, um, and Brandon. Hi everyone, can you all hear me? Can you hear me, John? Especially you, John. Yeah. Okay, so here's a little story I'm gonna tell. The first time I met John Melillo was 10 years ago this fall. We were at a restaurant in Tucson. Uh, I don't think the restaurant exists anymore, actually. Um, we were standing at the bar when John showed me a diagram. It was, if I'm remembering correctly, a diagram of one of the battles described by Tolstoy in his thousand page novel, War and Peace. The diagram also, if I'm remembering correctly, consisted of lines and arrows and X's and black and red, like a football play or a treasure map. And the diagram was, and I know that I'm remembering this correctly, surrounded by hair, because the diagram was most remarkably tattooed on John's forearm. Imagine the mind and the commitment, maybe even the madness of a person who would tattoo a graphic interpretation of an excerpt from a thousand page novel on their arm. I remember thinking, who is this person? And what is it about this battle that this person wants to carry around with them for the rest of their life? 
What is it that this person does not want to forget? I don't know if I ever asked John that question, actually, um, and I don't think he ever told me. But I also remember thinking that maybe it was not, in fact, a diagram of a battle at all, but a map to something that could only be discovered upon John's death, when his arm would one day be picked up, dusted off, and finally, maybe fatally understood. Anyway, that was the first time we met. I went home that night, looked up John's contact info on the University of Arizona website, and for some reason, I emailed him uh, George Oppen's poem, Myth of the Blaze, to which John emailed back almost instantaneously this passage from Deleuze and Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus. Quote, a child in the dark, gripped with fear, comforts himself by singing under his breath. He walks and halts to his song. Lost, he takes shelter or orients himself with his little song as best he can. The song is like a rough sketch of a calming and stabilizing, calm and stable center in the heart of chaos. Perhaps the child skips as he sings, hastens or slows his pace, but the song itself is already a skip. It jumps from chaos to the beginnings of order in chaos and is in danger of breaking apart at any moment. I think he actually put the page number in there too, page 311. <laughs> um, how flirtatious. I take these lines with the diagram tattooed on his arm as John's way of introducing himself to me, a stranger, even maybe to himself. And I understand these lines to form his Ars Poetica and or whatever might be its equivalent in sound. Ars sonica, ars musica, ars melodica, ars chaotica, with a child in the dark taking shelter in his song, being John. Anyway, shortly after this, John invited me to a show of his at the Red Room. Uh, I'm assuming some people here remember the Red Room, uh, the bar attached to Grill on Congress. It had a sunken, sodden sort of underworld feel. That is, if I'm remembering it correctly. I remember John's music sounding like if someone took a cassette player, put in Bruce Springsteen's Nebraska, pressed play, then threw the whole thing down a well. His music sounded, in other words, like the transcription of a person being withdrawn from presence into absence, then projected back into presence, but reconstituted as the hallucinatory feedback of an Orphean ghost by which I mean a sound that does not end, but accumulates even as it simultaneously attenuates and is accentuated into a calming and stabilizing, a sheltering panorama of dirgeful, wave-like experience. 10 years after he introduced himself to me, I have the pleasure of introducing him to you. John Melillo is the maker of many things including sound works, songs, digital experiments, concrete poetry, sound poetry, objects and texts ranging from the academic to the ephemeral and free. His book, The Poetics of Noise from Dada to Punk, which constructs a literary history of noise through poetic sound and performance, was published by Bloomsbury last year and is being released in paperback this spring. He has performed widely and has released two albums under the name Algae and Tentacles. The self-titled de debut, which came out from Lightning Records in 2015, and The Mouth is a Resonant Field, which is coming, I think, I hope soon, from um, 2182 Recording Company, which is based in Arizona. John, meanwhile, is based between the mountains and the sea in Nova Scotia. Oh my God, Brandon, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, <laughs> I haven't, things haven't changed. I mean, what do I need to say? <laughs> thank you, Brandon. Um, it's truly amazing to have you introduced me. Um, 
and to explain me to myself, uh, explain this to myself, which I often do think, what was that? What was this battle of Austerlitz, this this first battle in Tolstoy? What what is happening there? This is the beginning of thinking through that. Um, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being here. Um, I it's really wonderful to see all your squares. Um, thank you to Johanna and the rest of the Pog board. Um, thanks for organizing all this. Thanks, David, for taking on the technological issues. Um, and thank you, Ann Waldman, for being here. Uh, it's really an honor to read with you tonight. So uh, I'm really excited about everything to come. Um, so <laughs> I'm excited to share some work with you. I mean, this is my first in real time um, performance, actually, uh, since February of 2020. I've been, uh, you know, done some th other digital things online, um, but this is the first time that it's happening in real time. So it's kind of wonderful and strange. Um, so I'm going to read a few things uh, and make some sounds. And I guess I want to say that, like, what holds all of this together is a is an interest, or maybe even obsession with the conditions by which sounds or selves or objects or music emerges out of all of the rest of it, all the noise. Um, how do things come out of that noise and figure themselves forth to us? Um, it comes from a love of possibility and, and failure and uh, falling, all of these things. So, um, so I hope to, to keep that, that as the connecting thread, <laughs> if it is a connecting or disconnecting thread. So the first thing I was going to read is actually from a chapbook that I, I helped make um, with uh, Amanda Bukusen and Jake uh, Ficker at, at Tanline Studios in Tucson that's going to accompany the LP that Brandon talked about, uh, The Mouth is a Resonant Field, and it has the same name, The Mouth is a Resonant Field which should hopefully emerge after many COVID delays um, in uh, the spring or early summer of 2022. So here's the first bit of that. What if all memory is just a way of moving your mouth? Isn't just this cavity, muscles and parts. A song isn't over. The body moves, there's air. What's the memory of the mouth? Another machine hears it and plays it back, another and another. It's a way of transport. The noise we move around in, blocks of sound over time. You go, amble in the ambient. The mouth, a chamber, a field, a space, a grave, an echo, wave. Let's skip ahead a bit. It is a limit, not measure. Can you write it? Conversational tone, heightened voice, between voices, ears, things, technologies, machines, objects, transpositions, and transductions. All those little encounters, really slow and very apparent. I am not sitting in a room. And as Brandon alluded to, um, I, uh, last year, COVID year, my book, uh, The Poetics of Noise, From Dada to Punk, emerged in the world, thanks to um, Bloomsbury's uh, sound studies um, list. And um, so I'd just like to read a little bit from it. This is not, of course, the place to do sort of a long, uh, critical introduction to the book. Um, but I just want to say quickly that what it is, is a, it, it's a tour through some salient moments in 20th century poetry, uh, lyrics, and recorded performance uh, where language encounters and tries to recreate the unknowingness of noise. Um, and I get that, that sense of unknowingness of noise from a, a nice quote from Lisa Robertson from an essay called Disquiet, where she says, quote, an unknowing expands within noise, but it feels convivial. So, I wanna be inside of the conviviality of noise. So here's um, a little bit from the middle of the book where I'm talking about uh, uh, poets uh, and early um, punk artists uh, in New York 
at the end of the 1960s and 1970s, a scene that our other reader, Ann Waldman, will know well and may tell us stories about here. <laughs> um, and in which uh, I'm interested in sort of the ways that uh, poets and, and musicians at the time were sort of melding their practice and thinking about noise together. So here's what I'll say. For downtown poets and musicians, a poem or a song could become an act of appropriation and reinvention. It could be a movement through the city that does not merely drift through or take place in certain spaces, but reuses space in new and idiosyncratic ways. Writers and poet performers, these writers and performers celebrated a dispersed, oblique play of desire in which mastery is dislocated into the figure of an active, if meandering, engagement with the city. In this situation, the city's heterogeneous spaces and sounds do not become the backdrop for a cagey and close listening, but rather become ambient intertexts for literary and musical material. Cage's rhetoric of imminence of aesthetic uselessness gives way to urgent and immediate use. Noise does not simply exist in itself. It names a deforming critical force that intervenes in the sound writing of these poets and performers. They rearrange the phonographic texture of poetry and they produce noise in the image of the social spaces around them. And I think that's like a connecting thread through the book is how poets are producing noise in the image or in the figure of social spaces around them. It's about folding noise in. So in the passage I just read, I, I um, dig a little at John Cage um, and say there's something that emerges. And of course, there has to be something that emerges afterwards. Um, but I'm going to steal from John Cage uh, in order to kind of get through the rest of the book, which of course, even as I read it, I have to edit it and change it. And it's always this, this morphing, moving thing for me. Um, but I want to just uh, read this little bit uh, from the end of it. <clears throat> um, but as a thanks for introducing me, I've used um, Brandon Shimoda's name as a misostic to rewrite the beginning of the final chapter of the book. So for everyone who, probably everyone here already knows, but for anyone who doesn't know, um, a misostic is where you find letters of a key word or name and reconstitute the text with the words that include those letters. Um, so as you're searching for the letters, you kind of remake uh, a set of texts that emerges from them. So I've been a bit loose with my misostic in the same way that John Cage is loose with his misostics of James Joyce and of Ezra Pound. Um, but anyhow, here is a misostic for Shimoda. Both the communal now brings bodies together, remaking languages address, a disavowal, these moments concluding. Sound makers, physiology, the act of articulation, computer, in order to body the simple materializations. Because that inform musicians, noise as models, Christoph, expansive and indeterminate, structure, and they figure voice experiments in forms all draw attention, oral delivery to hear noise. Being written, historical, and coed, alluded to, becomes invested. Susan Hecker, question music through precursors, describes improvisations. <clears throat> so we can leave that. Um, aside now, and we can move on to a few improvisations and songs. Um, so I want to share um, three pieces with you. And again, this sort of disparate, wide ranging, uh, uh, fugitive practice that I'm trying these days. Um, and uh, I just recently in an online magazine called Anamorphosis, um, published a concrete poem, um, called Song, and it's based on a, a, a translation of a poem by Heinrich Heine that's in a 19th century anthology uh, of poems on the ocean. So I'm going to read that as the first thing. Um, the second thing that I'm going to uh, do is um, sing, read 
uh, perform a hymn uh, to the tune Coles Hill, <clears throat> which is a very old tune from like 1600s. Um, and I'm going to sing it with uh, new uh, lyrics. Um, and, you know, the whole idea of these tunes back in the day was that you could have the tune and then uh, whatever sort of religious text, um, you could just decide that was going to be the text today and you could sing it to the tune. And so there's still uh, a, quite a um, performance um, tradition of this, particularly in the Gaelic speaking parts of Western Scotland and even in some parts of the Appalachian Mountains. <clears throat> and so you have these sort of like two technologies of language and tune that sort of come together and can be broken apart and reconnected in different ways. And then the final thing uh, I'll do is what I'll call mouth music, um, but it's not mouth music uh, in the classic uh, Scottish Gaelic or Irish Gaelic sense. Um, it's a very different kind of mouth music. Uh, and I think you'll see so just before I do that, um, I'm just going to quickly change my microphone here and then we'll get on with it.
So I, in my, thank you. <laughs> so that's it for me. But I did want to say that I missed, I forgot to say that the, the, the reconstituted lyrics of that hymn are um, from uh, a poem by Marian Moore, uh, from a contemporary Mexican philosopher, uh, Ermgeld Immelheins, and uh, kind of recreated, reconstituted um, words from the Italian philosopher, uh, Franco Berardi. So um, that's where the texts came from. Thank you all. Thank you again, Brandon. Thank you, Pav. Um, really excited to share all this. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, John. That was wonderful um, and uh, exciting and noisy, and we loved it. And uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, then, um, yeah. Then I think it's time for for Charles to introduce Anne Waldman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Joanna, and thank you, John. The ears, the ears. I'm uh, Charles Alexander, one of the POG founders and directors. And I began my own work in poetry, which sometimes has meant introducing other poets long before POG began. I figure I've been introducing poets for at least 40 years, probably a bit longer. And in all that time, I can think of no one who needs less introduction than Anne Waldman, but I'm not gonna let that stop me. <laughs> Since I began with the scope of time, let me say that Anne has been publishing poetry now in seven decades, seven. She was in attendance at the 1965 Berkeley Poetry Conference, and that was one of the sparks as she entered her work in poetry. But thinking of time, this is very small potatoes, as Anne's work reaches back to the earliest of surviving Greek poetry, Asian poetry, even to the hymns of Inanna, perhaps the oldest surviving poetry on the planet Earth. And Anne's work reaches forward to that possibility of survival on the planet and survival of the planet through her work to further us all, as she has been one of our human spokespeople for human rights, native rights, gender rights, non-human rights against the effects of the Anthropocene, and so much more. Anne Waldman may in fact be an oracle like those ancient, though I think they have been here through the ages, voices who had like Anne an insight to and an inspiration from the divine, yet also had profound interest in provoking the best of the human world. One could do far worse during a life in these decades since the 1960s than simply to follow where Anne leads. She has accomplished such work through her participation in a variety of movements, including moments on the street on various continents, through her many breathtaking and breath-giving performances, often in collaboration with musicians and other artists, through her brilliant and careful direction of the Naropa University Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics, through her writing of manifestos and essays that make invaluable suggestions to our present and future activities. I think of a work like Feminifesto, where she speaks, among other things, of poets all in a kind of temporary autonomous zone of exile. She says, you can't territorialize a mind of artistic exile and the de-territorializing that such a frame of mind engenders, which is why one is drawn to poetry which like music deterritorializes, gives strength to the practice and takes one to places of risk and anarchy. Poetry is not empire building, it deterritorializes empire. And more than anything, she works through her poetry, which we are about to hear. In one of her great works, the three volume, the Iovis Trilogy, she can write tenderly to remind us that we are connected to stamen or pistol, the what we came in with, and who are we apart from flowers? And she can teach in the same work so that you 
Don't let global warming slip your mind. Invoke the Udumbara flower that blooms every thousand years. And she can counsel us when rage is needed. You do the math, the wrath, in response to the 1,464 victims of Hurricane Katrina, largely unsung. And she can tell us to cheer up, for we still have work to do that will take such cheer. And that, though we are in the last hours, these hours are in a still wild place. I've been quoting from near the end of Aeobus, but I'd like to invite and welcome you tonight by going back to the beginning of that work, to the end of what is titled A New and Stands as a Kind of Preface, where she writes, Colors and how they might move us through prisms of language and light. See the glow of the world around us. Luminous particles and syllables. Hurry, hurry, make haste, make haste. Don't tarry, don't tarry. I, I was going to stop there, but she reminded me uh, when we got on this evening um, of new publications. I, I know on her website, the publications listed are uh, about 125, uh, 60 of which are books and pamphlets, but she has new books from Coffee House, uh, from Hostla, from uh, uh, and Sionica, and she has new LPs. She never stops, and neither should we. Please welcome Ann Waldman. Please unmute yourself, Anne. Thank you so much, Charles. That's so heartening. Thank you so much. And thank you, John. That was so intense and interesting. Haven't heard anything like that on Zoom. So thanks for that. And to see, see read some recent things and uh, maybe a little bit from this new edition of the Terigata, the Terigata, the songs of the sons and daughters of Buddha in the new edition with new uh, versions, translations worked uh, with uh, Andrew Schelling, the Sanskritist. So maybe end with those. But this is a piece um, I found myself, let me find my glasses here, found myself going out a lot to check out the night sky and right all night, sort of inspired by these uh, meditations, as I call them. So this is called, I wanted to tell you about my meditations on Jupiter. Grasping at fragments, I want to tell you at a distance, distant about the recital and its amplification. I thought Unicum in the varying versions, urgent meditations on Jupiter, my remotest wandering, its chilly motion, ice and patterns, striations seem to be models of tissue and imprint, solitude, solicitudes. In Persian, it might be a humancy. What is the sand you imagine trapped in your echo chamber? A telescope of no small size, a clipsedra of wondrous watery proportion, the greatest clock of tidal universe. What can you know? Recital as a dispatch, as a way signaling a spin. This is a meditation on time made of glass. When the electricity stops, the clocks go off on their own, those not surveilled. Switched calendars, new technology, they will place an owl in your classroom to keep track of your study, your assignments, your assignments. Are you on time for class in an alienated classroom, the talisman of your own mind? And you feel split in time. You feel your head dizzying as your eyes land on the handmade machine of words, repeating forms from Dante's Inferno, dancing in a circle of left-hand turns, tuning up on the day of reckoning as you ascend. I love the credit. I want everything to pile up in solitude, counting backwards. The time you thought you were on, then there were paused interventions all through your life. Ventricles, I need advantage and ventilators. I need vehicles as in the lesser and greater veils of Dharma. The recital of Hai Ibn Yaksan was written during his detention in the fortress of Fartijan. The narrator or author, Ibn Sina, speaks of a time when his soul was at home and could go out to the familiar 
but finding places that lay hidden in his own city, captivity in a cosmic crypt, a dark pit in which also the pilgrim of the recital of Occidental exile is stuck, an inward escape, call it. Solitude summons high Ibn Yaqsan's vision, waiting for the invitation to leave the prison whose jailers know they are not themselves captives. What is imprint in a brain? Symbols, allegories, what can we learn of carceral in a book? A day in the can when you want plutonium off your front range, when you want to control the narrative of toxins in land, water, the cellular throb and breath of toxins, and you protest all day, all months, all thousands of years, Deformed sheep born at dawn, an eye missing in a dispatch. The gasp is echoing through time here in capsule. Study the surfaces of sand in an age that crumbles like sand. Count the eyes on potatoes. Study a field chart of matres, of mothers. Write a book that opens to the sky. Conjure Hermes, Hermes Trismegistus, who witnessed the angel Jibril in a dream. My chambers are like cubicles in the library, the shelves swaying as in an hallucination. I had to leave all that behind at the New York Public Library. I still hold a key to a research room and pray they will let me in again, study scripture, the rise and fall of everything, and the age of reason again. Not a philosopher, I am reluctant to get loose with poetical intuitions, but they are all of the above, what I have admitted here into this cavity how to be urgent at remote control, shake a dying body awake for an instant, happy recognition, mysteriously guided to text that fluctuates in the mind, comes and goes, lost the little pencil for my request, they arrive as if telepathically, fragments, fragments as I say, grasping and fragments, on the nature of prediction, there is none arising, the crystal mirror is cloudy. Watching the child on the small screen, she is learning K. She is writing K for the first time. I think of Aya Sophia, that elder library where it is recorded this kind of memory, the first K of knowledge. Her name is Cora. These were the categories of her studying wandering, roaming days of cold light, mind not yet caught by the death clouds, breath of death, breath of life impelling days, mind in the heavens with distant moons, Enceladus, her oceans hidden under icy crust, lift the curtain, you may see the future of water. Crisis, jeopardy, propulsion and scrying, hazards, restless, brutal patrols, corner of a watery eye, keening, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto as top moons for the dark time. Oral tradition, Tradition told the future that this was ancestral transmission, how to be alone with the four rotations, how not to go mad. I thought her thrill of discovery, child's first instinct, she be in this looking up, but we are not awaiting Martian travel. We notice patterns of solar systems. What is identity in this? Naming, make a list, lifting the supermoons out of a host of 70, or is it 79 now? the counting of so many moons, volcanoes and snowfields of Io, a moon of fire and ice, colors which show red, orange, yellow, black, white, smallest of Galileans, then Europa in circles with cracks and fissure that would haunt your notebooks 20 to 180 million years ago, a young face, Ganymede, highly cratered and light grooved terrain across the face. Callisto probably unchanged since its formation. How could you ever guess? Out of the radar of Jupiter's magnetic field, beyond Jupiter's radiation belt, untethered, more to study each moon a year in your life. Reflectivity, that's the dispatch here. Perhaps oceans beneath the surface could flourish with life. A wandering mendicant in my heart, and this was wanted, I wanted was what I wanted to say to you, mendicants coming after, crying for all the others in plague to no truth of suffering, could be signaling the end of entire civilizations. You go studying the plague of Cyprian, the plague that ended serfdom, the plague of London, shortest in a year, only 100,000 dead. Think with me now on all the friends, all the last rites for those afflicted, 
AIDS, like the strike of a large gong, 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 gong. As you say it, AIDS, the fallen. Solipsism is my instrument for seeing. We keep thinking about the future. This fluctuating uncertain magic is apocalyptic by nature. And we are forgetting our rituals, our Jupiter glowing out there right now, sitting here, it's 318 in mountain time. Look out my hatch on the sky, an ingenious bubble of shelter. See the comet glide across your wounded galaxies because you have a mind to project that heartbroken song. Evidently, celestial physics and astronomy define the soul's itinerary like a comet. If you want to greet it that way with an angel as a guide, escape right now. Traces are discernible in the recital of Hai Ibn Yaksan, realizing a kind of transmutation where there is interiorization of the cosmos, emergence, as is said, from the cosmic crypt. The recital is imploding in on itself. What is the data? An enveloping sphere to save phenomena, a body's motion considered in longitude, in latitude, swiftness and slowness, proximity and distance from the earth. Here, us again, we think like that, our earth. I keep saying distance, us as homocentric to the center of the earth. Seven spheres, and then there was the eighth enveloped, and the whole was the sphere of the fixed stars. Would that be absolute? Why would anyone want that? But the modern followers of Ptolemy added a ninth, a starless sphere, communicating that the astronomer must try to solve the notion of an unmoving Earth. What will we continue to know when science leaves us stuttering, turn off the light, enter that little cavity, find a corner, a movie theater, unsafe in 2020, in 2021, 2022, 2023, how long is your play? 2043, 2073, 2093, 2099, 2099, 2099, 2099. Thank you. And this is... Um, I worked on the libretto for an opera that Philly Opera is going to do, but it's also become a movie first. And I was the assignment was Antonin Artaud, David Lynch, and William Burroughs. So this is a little bit from the little bit of the Artaud text. Uh, it was a much longer text, and then the composer David T. Little, you know, used the things that worked for him. And as in many operas, there's a lot of kind of re repetition. Uh, here's a quote from Artaud, circa 1945. We are not yet born. We are not yet in the world. There is not yet a world. Things have not been made. The reason for being has not yet been found. This is uh, you know, spinning off um, Anais Nin's diary where she has an account of Artaud in, um, in this, at the Sorbonne on stage uh, enacting the plague. Strange light in the lodge, repository of dark memory, spectral gesture. In 1933, Artaud performed an enactment of the theater and its play. Body is future memory, as inscription, as keeper, spectacle for masses. His face was lean. The visionaries thrust to be incomprehensible, ensorcelled. The plague everywhere, death in the street, in garrets, black alleys, in carts of doom, in aporia, in bardo, edges between and between. His hands were trembling, eyes rolling into the back of his head, looking inward, transported to an excruciating intensity. Our toe in the Black Lodge, cave of flickering shadows, sequester in death. What doctor in this house? that we all see demon plague take hold, that our hearts break or that fear turns us away, us too, could that be every one of us? Us too in the anthropocene lose control, how close we are to dark animalia, to avoid the abyss, so generative cyclic flow and grind of meat wheel that we decompose, lose breath and still sing. Our toes apotheosis, palpable dark spirit babble in the theatrical light. Center stage, shape-shifting show of demons, all the alchemical nuances, glass shatters, people in panic as he gasped, afraid of their own demise, jeering and hissing at him. 
La Peste, they call out. La Peste, La Peste, as it sweeps the land, a crux in your mirror. La Peste, La Peste, the poet summoning and summon, dwelling in his own, your own gut and burning throat. La Peste, La Peste, La Peste. And he went crazy that night and had to keep part it off. Just a little reminder. So, um, yeah, a couple of things here. Um, this is sort of what, this is the P, a piece on Siamaki, uh comes from a text called Extinction Aria. So I'll just do a little bit of this. Um, it's got wonderful, you know, music on the recording, but just to invoke it a little bit. If the warmonger is inventing a battle cry, he always he is ready to go and he thinks, I am a god. You will know this by an easy slogan. Words will be cheap. I am a good 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 god. I am a good 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 god. A simple word signal signaling assemblages that have power. If the warmonger is insistent, he's surprising himself. Him, it's always him. He's turning to the mirror of himself to worship himself and then turning as if he seems to trace an enemy. He needs to do this. He will. It is what he is doing. Tracing the enemy, an imprint for the psyche, the habit of the psyche. This is apparati of becoming enemy is the creation of a warring God realm of becoming embattled, isolated, and a kind of ghostly corporeality. The white ghost, the slaver, hunter of indigenous ones, knows no solitude, the karmic nightmare, scaffolding doom, brought nature inside and rippled its guts, no umbrage, the warrior, a sum total, but with Dorje and Purba brandishing power. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Lake in capital, lake interiors. What happened to the vast land landscape outside? Hold the metaphor for your sensation filtered out of memory and love. What was it? Only after a kill could you love your own death experience of passing through. There is no enemy but the one manufactured, a beautiful enemy, worthier than you are, holds secret of poetry. Da, 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 da. Ink knows this in creating weaponry, lights the optic nerve, long and hard. You will be machine of death. The drawings are complex. They fly, they go up in the sky. You can be a child again. And as you die, you see red. Ink knows the creation of enemy. Ink would be harmonious in duty, would be harmless, blind, unseen, were it not enemy calling ink to task and telling and becoming if it weren't for enemy flailing and wares, ever new economies of things to go, tonally gray. The marks respond to the inner clock. Wind down and explode, a, a grid, a grip, Scott spirals loop and all the waves in ink make, whether it's blood, but it's a vertigo, a kind of revelation the enemy is recognized by his uniform hair stands on end, the terracotta warrior inside the mind, the pink of rocks becoming pink of sky as you die, selling weapons you love to make for the enemy. Ink settles here like the blood it is, ink making a kind of ancestry, a mark, a rapid deployment, swift, swift. Ink is the challenge, ink a drawing, embodiment of an idea. Last call before you amass all your wealth. Think it's a method to see our concept of the world, a world of undulation, like the sea creatures remember when they are in the sea and stroked as they drown. Da, 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 da. Devaloka, Devaloka, place of the gods, anything you want, all the pleasures you could ever imagine. And they are hoarded, jewels clustered around the neck, oceanic ripples of all exorcisms, thrill the chakras, drugs are nothing compared to the ecstasy of the god realm, and will you age, will the seat get hot, and you fall off, the sky is not blue, and will not hold. Okay, let's see here. And I wanted to read um, two things that came out of thinking about Diane de Prima, who passed not so long ago. And this was 
in the spirit of her revolutionary letters and there's a new edition of that and with the things she was writing before she passed. And it's kind of a, some kind of um, revolutionary letter called This is the Antithesis Reality. When the mode of the music changes, the walls of the city shake for Diane in memoriam. We're coming out of our little theaters of hope and fear to a city near you. We'll breathe again on the streets and liberate the hall of justice. And we are the antithesis reality. All is brought to transparency. Twilight cannot be delayed. This is the antithesis reality. It's a deluge of fire, a climate apocalypse, watching the bloody moons and magenta suns of dust and smoke dynamite the sky, roiling in polite society in a gentleman's agreement in the sick corridors of corruption where the fix is in the fixes in and nano racism and hydraulic racism haunt the premises but this is the antithesis reality coming at you can't pull the wool over antithesis reality's eyes the security state thrives on insecurity and a war on daily life itself call in the paramilitary summon the space force put a token woman on the moon we're taking down oligarchy oligarchy's assault antithesis reality against psychopathic data flows damming up Rabbit holes won't swallow snake oil hypocrisy, fraud, mentacity. This is the revving up of the antithesis reality. This is the antithesis reality. We ain't no foggy mirage. We're slamming your politics of decivilization. We're the antithesis reality here to reinvent resistance, not risk lives of tender beings in time of plague. We're coming out of our little boxes to a city near you, a town, crossroads, turning down the static, voting against capital's extraction of all from all. We're masked and mouthing the takedown, voting against this ugly abusive language. We like to fall in love with whomever we want and dance in contrapuntal rhythm. We are the antithesis of reality, a refuge voting against reification of land, of living and regenerative earth, all peoples, organisms of water and air, voting against borders, drones, caves, and carceral torture. We're spooky attraction and distant growing closer here to reanimate beauty and wisdom. We intend the possibility of art for transformation, innovation. We intend to get it revving now. This is the antithesis reality. We earth our charge, extract arrows of America will metaphor morphosize this techno thanato porno punked out empire to the innermost shimmering fabric of the 1000 things of this world. Don't lose your mind. This is some old out of an old um, journal with invoking Diane. I'm calling it practical thunder. I remember phone calls to Diane after a breakup. She, like Joanne, would advise that you keep the domicile somehow. That was more important than heartbreak. A domicile was somehow tangible. Where will you work? Set up your shrine. Living is too expensive. It's not economical. Can't someone live in the closet, in the garage, work it out, take turns? Don't be privileged about this nightmare of survival. Not wise ecology. But the pain, you'd say, stay friends. And there would be that lovers to brothers. Get out from under what burns you about the Kerouac school, your great vow. They say it's not a school without a building, an endowment supposed to get straighter. Don't spend all the time resisting. But of course, all the time resist. Make shape of your own imagining for it. What would you like to envision if you split with that? A school you make, think about how they'd have to deal with the load you lifted, panic about archive. Maybe someone will wake up and maybe not. If you're so damn wide awake, no one will think they have to be too, too, too. <laughs> they have to be too scared to let go. Mm, guess so. But I promised Robin Blazer in archive heaven together. And Amity said, don't let them die. Don't forget. The left-hand path, Ulat Bamsi, topsy-turvy, who's in, who's out. We're all the scandal, never to be an apologist for anyone, not the godforsaken beast. Please, we will have our beat day in court for third eye, high concerned, out from under, was inside, checking me out through the wires, maybe feeling a pulse inside sympathy, how hand pulls hair back out of your eye, what you taught me, wipe your eyes, ease and not words so uptight, let things unfold of their own volition, don't push to study every which way of which of the magic arts, take a symbol, stay with it, a witchy way, visualize it as it moves through, they'll come requesting you, the bodhisattvas, I promise, the perfect symbol for you, the perfect Yidam, inner deity secret, I know I say these things 
things are symbols of themselves. Get out of New York more often, but don't you miss it? It's always with me. You don't want to stop. What about Bobby Dylan? Lucky to have seen him play live all those times. Whatever the thunder, nice time, nothing to cling to. How can poets live that luxury? Why can't rock and roll do more for the cause? It's some kind of God realm thing. What kind of music is it anyway? I guess for the pleasure of God realm, Deva Loka, could you be jealous of the God realm? I'll never be able to define that soft indulgence. And Ginzi, he wasn't there with you when you met Ali at the garden backstage, having to deliver a spontaneous poem for he said, so you're a poet and you know it intersections for consociational map with his bodyguards in pastel, not more unlikely contenders in the night. Bob was purpose, purposely confusing W.S. Burroughs with Tennessee Williams. And we were going to meet Raul Castro at a party where I'd say William and he'd say Tennessee. I sometimes wanted to get to a monastery. You want to indulge. Wait till the seat does get too hot and you crash. Get back on stage for idiot wins. Syndrome like a stone rolls home in no direction, more like a tambourine. It's the sexy sub vocal of all the songs when you hear the man talking beyond himself like Glenn Gould humming with Bach. The inner tune. And um, I should, let's see. So this was done during time. It's called All Rainbows in a Brainstem That We Be So Contained with the artist Natalie Provosti. These wonderful, they're pretty subtle. You can't quite see all the nuances of these beautiful color. Prince. And uh, this came out of a trip right before, it was the summer before we went in lockdown down to the border, to the uh, cages where they were keeping infants and children. We couldn't get in, of course, it was in uh, Clint, uh, Texas, but went with um, poet friends, including Julie Carr and Swanee and, and um, let's see. I write about it a little bit later, sort of talking about Ed Dorn's um, poetry and, and linking that to this, you know, map and crossing the borders. But anyway, this is not, that's not in this section. Night haze, love across walls is fable, tugs is oracular color at hand for migrant to save the world is spiral of shell trying to climb out of phantasmagorical visionary space silence and tell about it it tugs can you see a nautilus a maze a scream in a little abode the cell seated an empty playground something tugging at ear to break in red concede ne'er succeed but waking to alterity detail porque Lorando's niños secedes push open to shelter in place, something tugging at ear to break in red. All rainbows in a brainstem see your wide pearly aura at the end of a brush, a glee of whiteness surrounds paper that bleeds out of the cage, flush, splash of humans, deeper tone, muzzles, no pagan of passage, writes us in erotics. Look up, no pasaran, rook. Ness, no libation here. It's the razor wire. What's making me power my dream? We are in retreat in mauve in rust. Forces of quarantine advance, turn in an urn in a city. What line becomes mass camouflage in ashes? Ancestors, we sleep standing up in a system calibrated to fail. Archive of soft, unsegmented bodies rest here. Sweet chiton, no spine in hierarchy. Three million off food stamps, then a not kind way to hit ankles at borders. Soldiers allowed to shoot unarmed protesters in Palestine, going backward in the spiral down, wrinkle at beam or conjure a corner. Bathe in light, going backward in heart and back a step and back a step when you are alone and the climate changes at edge spider of room will succumb. How nerve got back at sleeve of blanket succulent. Robust attention, air you grind, grind. Remember the beauty of her line. Her face was contained out on a grid. Baby face, walk cross crested landscape, surface study, perhaps a kind of ineluctable table distortion or meteoric that we be so constrained in prophecy. 
Two women in distant space descend with gentle words for the black eyes summit swarms of divination want to suspend death as you fly. Hey, over here, face to the law and all sorrow. Hey, 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 over here, dress down, flying off the page. What glue will hold our mouths in lockdown till we speak here, here, here are have suspended, face at waist looking down, fact at wrist to bend a page, a butt down on luck, face won't let mortify a brush stroke ablution necessary when you need safety, face as if in dialogue, face a wrist turn and you stand tall, face a wrist, face insulting on sequester, face escape but insisting on leave me your voice, leave me your voice, leave me your voice, feeling of inside to make a job of, a, of it, what will not be done. 12 red squares on a precipice, on a prejudice, one for each day, many having frames. It's just a little bit of that. I'm gonna close with a couple of the uh, poems from the Terry Gata. These are some of the oldest poems by um, monks and nuns. These were not in any kind of monastery. And uh, let's see. Yeah, there's very an intro and an afterward, but just a few notes preserved in Pali, the written language that had the script, held the scriptures of foundational Buddhism. The Teragata and Teragata are two collections of poetry regarded as having been composed and recited during the lifetime of Siddhartha Gautama, the historical Buddha. Around 80 BCE, the poems got transcribed in written form, probably cut with a metal stylus into palm leaf manuscripts, which were then washed over with ink at a great Buddhist council in Sri Lanka during the reign of King Bhattagamana, circa 8977 BCE. Tradition ascribes most of the poems to direct disciples of Buddha, meaning that they had circulated by word of mouth for 350 years or more. Part of an enormous oral tradition preserved in memory and passed from person to person for centuries, the poems were probably first sung in Magadhi, a vernacular of Northern India, thought to be the language of the early Buddhist Sangha. So just a few. So this is um, Mahakala speaks. This lady who cremates the dead, black as a crow, she takes an old corpse and breaks off a thigh bone, takes an old corpse and breaks off a forearm, cracks an old skull and sets it out like a bowl of milk for me to look at. Witless brain, don't you get it? Whatever you do just ends up here. Get finished with karma, finish with rebirth. No more bones of mine on the slag heap. And this is um, Suspakala. Let's see. I'm trying to find some of the newer ones. Um, Suspakala speaks with Mara. I'll just end it here. Suspakala was sure of herself, her senses pure, her perception clear. She drank life's elixir, a sweet fluid sustaining that replenished her mind. Mara, the great tempter, interrupts. Don't forget where you've been before, those other lives you led in bittersweet realms. Animals, demons, pretas, her friends, companions, think about it, long for it, he whispers in her ear. Yearn again for the Kamaloka and the seductive beauty of the dark gods who rule in shadow and the blissed out gods who rule by day. They'll take you, caress your naked body. She, Susan McCullough says, she, she, it's she saying to Mara, stop, Mara. Don't you know those gods go from birth to death to birth to death again, again. Become this, become that, become this again, become that. You know the Kama Loka stinks with lust. I tell you, the world is blazing, blazing. The whole world's in flames. I tell you, it's flared up. The world is shaken. Your words are shaken. The whole world's a blaze. <laughs> I think everyone can unmute themselves if they want to now, if they want to, you know, uh, make a comment or ask a question or anything. Uh, I just want to thank you for bringing so much great work here, uh, both of you, and also the invocation of those Buddhist poets and of Diane de Prima. It seems just so important right now. I, I, I just heard a couple of days ago one of 
a poet I love that is so little known south of the Canadian border, Phyllis Webb just passed also. And if anybody's looking for a poet they don't know to read, please find her. She's among the most intimate of poets I've ever read. And, uh, but please, questions. Can you can you say the name again of the of the last book that you read from? Published by Shabaya, and it's called Song and Daughter Buddha, and it's uh, Enlightenment poems from the Terragata and Terragata, and uh, worked with uh, Andrew Schelling. So it's translated by uh, us, and Andrew knows uh, some of the Magadhi history. So we worked with the other versions. We, we looked up all we can. You know, people have taken this on and some of these texts on in kind of a new uh, new age versions and some very sco some scholarly works that are great. Do the whole, they're, they're larger books. Heidi, if you go, if you Google Anne's name hmm. and right. find her website, under the new tab on that website, you'll find that book and, and others of her new works too. Okay. Yeah, fantastic, both of you. It's so good to see you, John, because I I'm used to seeing you at uh, noise events. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're in Nova Scotia now. At the moment, yeah. Oh, okay. okay. We're returning. Yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Heidi. from what other people are from other places than Arizona? I can see a lot of people from other places. <laughs> oh, I'm visiting, I'm visiting from Atlanta. Hi, Ann. It's, it's an amazing reading. It's great to see you. I'm visiting from Berkeley, Ann. Hi. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm living in Los Angeles, and this was just the reading I needed. Thank you so much, both of you. It was fabulous. We're visiting from San Francisco and we fucked up the time zone. So we got arrived late thinking that six was six, but it wasn't six. But thank you, <laughs> Anne. <laughs> Hi, Anne. For research. Oh, Norma. Hey, Norma. Hey. Mm -hmm. Just when everyone gets used to the time difference with Arizona, all of you yeah. change to daylight savings time, and yeah. we don't. We don't. That's what happened? <laughs> That's right. That's her. I said to Norma, "We have five more minutes, and then Anne and John are going to start reading." And little did we know that had started fifty-five minutes ago. No matter how. Um, Hard, we all may work to achieve a sense of time as meaningless, it still gets in the way. Except there's recordings. Yes. Yeah, Yay. John will see you on the recording. <laughs> Within a couple of days, this will be somewhere on YouTube and I will announce that at various places and Facebook and Twitterverse and et cetera. Great. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. The, the, the next reading I know about, because I'm helping to sponsor it in Tucson, uh, is November 21st by uh, Rachel Blau um Michael Gottlieb, and Tom Mandel. And then the next POG reading, which is a collaboration with Chax Press and POG, is December 14th, and that is uh, Joanna Furman and Mary Rose Larkin, who's here with us tonight. Yes. And that's, uh, that's going to be the first in-person POG and Chax reading since you know, early 2020. So that will be at the St. Andrew's Church on Fifth Avenue uh, in the um Armory Park area. So. Future Charles in terms of 
I mean, this is coming up for Naropa because we're, we will probably try to open. We'll have to be very strict with the protocols. We can't really open it up to the public at large. It would just be too much mm-hmm. meetings and so on. But, um, you know, just one, you know, if one thing went wrong, then the whole thing could collapse. You know, if one person can't, and, and people say, well, what it, why not continue the hybrid? I said, well, but we want to get some live guests there. And do live guests want to come to Colorado and then do Zoom, you know, with people? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got muted again. I'm not sure. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now? Yes. Yeah. That's good. Yep. New York. Things are going on in other time zones and you're out and about in New York. And you're just like, oh, my God, I've got to get back for a Zoom. I'm not... Comf- I'm I'm not comfortable as yet as uh, we saw in the beginning. Somebody at the supermarket or somebody you know on the road somewhere. I always feel like I have to be in my own little space here. But I'm just wondering, does it get in the way of their city busier city schedules? Maybe it's just New York that makes me a little bit schizophrenic. <laughs> no, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. We're we're all feeling it. I think you cannot feel it. Yeah. Also, also, I think because it's so relatively easy to present readings on Zoom, there are so many of them. And I feel like I used to, you know, be called to go to a reading once every week or two. And now I get invitations almost every day I could go to a reading. <laughs> and I, I and you know, as much as I love poetry, I actually don't want to go to a reading every day. <laughs> Um, and could could you say something about the work on the archive at Naropa? Uh, because Naropa really can't have, I mean, we just don't have the bridge on a, 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 a can't be an archive if you have floods on your property. Mm-hmm. And what it would cost to build something up or away or get your kind of space. So trying to partner with your in- and that's looking pretty good, but I'm not supposed to talk about it publicly until we have um, made the arrangements. But I'd be very, very happy. And you know, when the pandemic started, I was talking to my friend, friends Jerry Heiler and Nick Dorsky. I said, "Oh my God, I'm just all these things that I want to do and build and issue and that and so on." And a lot of us have been involved. Met all of you, I know, in protests and so on. And then the issues about being out the street and how far. So I thought. Hey, and they said, well, you've always wanted to save the archive. Why don't you work on that? So mm-hmm. I'm kind of standing in the room. Everybody. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> hey, kind of going in and out a little bit. Yeah. Uh, does, is there going and, to- and I have a question. Um, when do you think the archive might be up and running again? Uh, do, is there any sense of time? We have to have it there for students and part of yeah. their work, you know, to get their cred- summer credits and even students coming from other institutions is to do a project at the archive. Mm-hmm. Well, handedly there. It's just a very small operation, but I would hope spring or summer, she'll, she'll let me know. I mean, okay. I'm so sorry about the carry research that you're trying to oh, do okay yeah um i i'm really well late spring or summer would be pretty good uh, that would be doable actually yeah and is the intent that the whole archive be digitalized of course well, that okay. i'm not talking about paper necessarily i mean there'll be some things that go from the print shop and so on but we're mainly it's the audio and video that have to be duration i years who knows you know where we're headed you have to you know waiting for the little chip that's going to hold the whole thing (laughs) 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 I wanted to hear you ask you about And we're just losing your audio constantly. Do you have a, is anything on your laptop you're using? Mm 
think something. I know you're not actually muted because that. <laughs> Zoom shutting down lots of okay. lots of audio today. Well, yeah. mine was my fault, but this is. John, how do you? I don't. I don't. I, how do you, do you make the decisions about your vocalizations? Um, is that improvisatory or do you work and rework things like with the, the, the kind of folk songs and things you were doing, particularly that piece? Um, well, the, um, the, 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 the song poem, the, the concrete poem that I first put up, that's, that's improvisatory, but, um, I, I'm sort of a very deeply, um, enamored with or influenced by uh, Susan Howe's uh, idea that every mark on the page is an acoustic mark. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I like this, this sense that every, you know, sort of bit of fragment of, of print uh, on the page is somehow connected to uh, an acoustic sound. So I feel like there's lots of freedom in that. It's also sort of, of course, very arbitrary and difficult to figure out like, what does that mean? You know, um, but it's kind of interesting to, to think about the possibilities that sort of emerge if we think of the text or the poem as a score for performance in the classic, you know, you know, projective verse kind of way. Um, maybe there's like ways that it sort of undoes that that projectivity. So I want to like be inside of that through improvisation. Um, but the song stuff, you know, I'm trying to I'm trying to hit the notes. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, but it's you know, uh, you know, it's 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 also in the midst of or um, uh, it's it, there's 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 also a, an improvisatory element too that I'm trying to incorporate there, um, particularly in the in some of the more um, ornamental things that are added on. I'm trying to get like beating tones, like things that sort of sound like you you can probably hear a kind of weird beating tone um as well as like having the the words come out do you also sometimes play the music while you're vocalizing the mm -hmm. yeah yeah so I'm, I'm you know i had my i it's weird on zoom you know you can you're sort of hiding everything but you know i had my keyboard happening at the same time and and all my electronic apparatus is all around me so yeah okay. <laughs> Never leave home without it. <laughs> it's sort of the gamelan approach to language and singing. You know, you, so you could have your gongs and your bells and your whistles and your little percussion and for all the all the sounds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're gonna need a like a whole band, aren't you? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you gotta be like. I'm um, just saying. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a you know you've got to we've got to do some four horsemen kind of uh, sound poetry band action. <laughs> I think we had talked about that, Charles. Let's start a sound. I think yeah, no, we could when we start meeting again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, when we can, yeah. When we can share each other's air again, which we can. Although there's some of that work, it would be it would be fun to recreate, but it'd be hard to imagine doing it any improving any on what the four horsemen did. <laughs> and I just want to say I loved your reading. I love how energetic you are. I have never seen you read sitting down. I have to say never. Yeah. And it's almost like you still weren't. You were going to climb like right through the, the the machine, and it was so wonderful and so energetic, and I so appreciate it. And uh, nobody reads as fast as Alice Notley, but you're very, very close. Yeah, you're very close. <laughs> and uh, I just uh, I love where you take it. You know, I love where it starts and how it rolls and go. It rolls all the way around, and it, you know, I just really appreciate that. It was. Uh, it's wonderful. Thank mm. you. So I, I have a question. And I, I liked that last in that last poem you read, there was this whole discussion of a, a sort of shape shifting deity. Could you say a little bit more about that? What was that that you were alluding to? R.A. 
who's always coming, you know, to the practitioner. It's the great obstacle. You know, sort of telling you try this or try that or you know, don't mess with go through the various temptations of Mara to, you know, to just uh, keep yourself on the path. So, mm-hmm. so it, in a way, become part of your accoutrements. So, so that's Mara? Mara. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, an aspect of your own mind, your projections. Mm-hmm. But you're all I'm right out my door. <laughs> it was just in this room not that long ago, so it's nice for you. <laughs> Your birth. Well, should we call it an evening, or does anybody have a last comment? I, mm. I, I guess I, my only last thank you would be to all of you who came. This was a very nice group. Just wondered how things are in San Francisco, where um, Norma and Robert are, or things. <clears throat> Politics and I mean, it's everywhere. I don't know if they're still with us. Storm, Norm, you unmute yourself. Yeah, they're gone. No, they're right here. They're here. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Uh, I think uh, I can. It's hard for us to hear you. I know. I'm not. It says I'm. Yeah. She asked how things are in San Francisco, both politically and maybe climate-wise and otherwise. Oh. Where would we start, really? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really. Yeah. Everything is like New York, New York or, or anywhere else. Politically, plummet wise, everyone is up in arms about everything. Yeah, I think Gloria might have something to add on that also, but just from a lot of our perspective, everyone's trying, and everyone is, of course, rightly um, scared as hell that there's a slow motion uh, film that the world saw in the late 20s and 30s. And just because the faces and the times look so different and so much has happened since then, it seems almost impossible that it could be happening again. So one just says, well, it sort of looks like it, but it's not. And um, then you wake up in the middle of the night thinking, uh, that's not a very uh, wise assumption. Can I be heard? Yeah. I yeah. was just thinking about, you know, this sense of uh, precipice, just being on this kind of precipice all the time. Yes. Yeah. Where it, you know, you get used to that and work with it. it's really a challenge with no, you know, no, or, you know, just on the cliff. It's really. And in a way, you also have to just pick with you know, what you with what you know at this point. You know, at this age, I just think, what am I capable of doing? I just have to keep doing these same things in a way because I have no power. Other categories, really. Yeah. On on the one hand, there are all the material conditions and those practical problems, and then on the other hand, the fascists are coming. So it's sort of like, <laughs> where do you put your energy? Right. Yeah, the fascists are here, Trace. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're coming back. They're oh. <laughs> hanging out backstage. <laughs> I'm impressed. With, I'm so proud of the poets. I'm just so proud. And there's been so much loss in the community and so much mourning and so on. But just how people have really come through in this time. It's really impressive. Hanging together with it all and, doing, and continuing to do work, which is... Well, thank you for your readings, and we were so sorry that we missed the first part of it, but we'll get the recording, and thank you, um, Charles, and everyone, as always, for making it all happen. It's just such a treasure. Thank you, Robert. It's so interesting for me to hear John.
Thank you. Thank you all. Everyone, safe travels. Thank, Thank you. you all. Very yeah. safe travels. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Everyone if be are, safe. Thank you. Tonight. If you're on the edge of a precipice, um, you still have ground under your feet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> True. <laughs> well, the world is turning under us as we walk. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. Thank okay, you, everyone. Good night. Good night Thank, you. Thank you, David, for hey, everybody. Yeah. Thanks, David. The evening. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everybody. Bless you.